Good afternoon, and welcome to the IPM Hour, hosted by the Southern IPM Center. Um, we've got a few folks just coming in now to the webinar and getting people kind of set up. Um, not a large crowd for today, so it's going to make it a little easier for us to actually interact with those attending the webinar. Um, this webinar series is put on by the Southern IPM Center. We're one of the four regional IPM centers funded by USDA NIFA to help coordinate IPM programs throughout the region. And as part of our responsibility, we're asked to hold a PD workshop or actually a PD meeting to allow people who have been receiving awards under crop protection and pest management to present on their work. Um, originally, we had these all planned for in-person meetings, but well, COVID happens. So we're online and doing webinars for this. Um, today, we have two speakers, David Kearns from Texas A&M University and Rick Besson from University of Kentucky. Um, they're going to be Show, telling us about their extension implementation programs that they've had in their states. If at any time you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. We have a fairly small audience for today. So raise your hand, we'll unmute you. You can ask your question and interrupt a little bit. Other than that, they're gonna have about 20 minutes for their presentation then they'll take questions at the end. So with no further ado, our first presenter today is David Kearns from Texas A&M University. All right. Well, thank you very much. And it's good to be here. Let me see if I can, okay. Uh, and I thank everybody for being here, especially after a lot of us had a long laborious night watching the election returns. Uh, the Texas IPM program, our extension uh, group, you know, we're really diverse. Uh, it covers a, a, everything from row crop agriculture to ornamentals, lawn and garden, and uh, of course, uh, structural and urban landscape type pests. But the first thing I want to do is, is really give you an overview of the, the people we have in our program. And it Really, I mean, this this is what drives us, and we have very high quality people, and this is the key to making anything successful. First off, our our extension specialists, and these are personnel who are actually faculty members. So these are these are faculty in the Department of Entomology at Texas A and M. Uh, you can see where they're located on the map. The uh, maroon stars are actually positions we currently have. The, the green ones are either where we've had recent retirements or where we've identified where we'd like to have personnel. But again, th so this, this group works in a variety of areas, agricultural, urban, uh, livestock, vegetables, uh, mosquitoes, you name it. They do a lot of outreach, some of it's statewide, some of it's more regionally based. And of course, uh, they're, they're tasked with doing a lot of the applied research that we use to drive our extension programming. We also employ extension program specialists, and these are typically master's level personnel. Now, we do have uh, some PhD people in the past. We don't have any right now. Um, these typically concentrate more on, on outreach driven programming. Uh, you, they'll do some applied research, but most of it is, is outreach uh, is, what, is what they do. Uh, primarily localized or regionalized, but there are a few of these individuals that have statewide responsibilities as well. And then our last group are our county IPM agents. Now, these are actually located at county offices. They uh, will typically oversee, you know, two to four counties, just depending on the position. Uh, they're primarily agriculturally based. Uh, they do get into some with landscape and uh, ornamental type of programming, but mostly, mostly agriculture. Uh, and, and they're very diverse. They, a lot of them will work in, uh, not just in pest management per se, but so they'll have programming in fertility and irrigation management and things like that as well. These are, we call these people our, our boots on the ground. 
and they have very close community ties. And so when we have large statewide projects, or it could be a regional project, a lot of times we'll, we'll form teams and these, these will form the foundation of our, our team programs. So that, that's our personnel. And now what I wanna do is get into some of the programming we have. Uh, and I'll start with agricultural crops and I wanna just really concentrate on a couple of areas. I mean, it's, it's a very large footprint here, but I'm gonna look at just a couple of the programs that we have going on. And the first of these is with the sugarcane aphid. And this was a pest that arrived in Texas and Louisiana in 2013 and then quickly spread through the Southern United States and all the way out west to California. It's a devastating pest of sorghum. It's, and so it's an invasive, it's an invasive aph aphid. Um, and I mean, literally could have destroyed the sorghum industry in the Southern United States. And uh, we, we had to respond to this pest extremely quickly. Uh, and we worked with a lot of other states too. Uh, just a, and so it just wasn't a Texas effort, for instance. I mean, this was this was a, a national effort to address this pest in sorghum. Looking at a lot of different uh, ways of managing the pest and developing a strong IPM systems. And just to look at kind of what we've developed. And again, this is this is from the whole nation, really. But we were very much a part of it. Just really came up with a fully set of integrated recommendations. And this goes from er everything from cultural control where you're planting early or trying to eliminate Johnson grass in the area, um, you know, planting a re resistant hybrids, identification of resistant hybrids, seed treatments, developing thresholds, uh, determining the impact of natural enemies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it's been highly, highly successful, uh, resulting in like very large economic impact uh, gains from the implementation of, of our recommendations. And in fact, we're, we're, when this pest first arrived and we were just hammered with questions from producers on, you know, what do I do, what do I do, to now they know what to do. We, we rarely get questions anymore and uh, they've really learned how to effectively manage the pest. So it's a highly successful program. The other is with BT resistance. And this is really came into light probably the last four years is when it's been most devastating. And with the development of uh, resistance with the uh, cotton bollworm or corn earworm to particularly the cry, the cry BT toxins. And this was, you know, really unexpected and before before the growers really just pretty much ignored this pest it was always effectively controlled with the the bt traits we had and people had quit scouting for them and people didn't even scout their cotton and then all of a sudden we got bull worms and nobody really knew how to scout for them anymore and or what they should spray for them or when they should spray for them or how to handle them. So again, we, we've had a big response to this is for surveying resistance to, to the BT toxins, determining new thresholds because those have changed, particularly when you're looking at a BT crop and how to treat for these pests, when to treat for them, what to treat with so you don't flare other pests and then to get out and train scouts and, per, and people to effectively scout for this, this pest. So it's kind of like reinventing the wheel on, on scouting cotton. It's, and again, we've had a lot of success here. We've, we've really uh, determined the value of different BT technologies, did a whole lot of scout schools, uh, put on online tutorials for scouting for bollworms and put a lot of information out in newsletters, et cetera, and have seen very, very good economic returns uh, from our surveys from anywhere from almost nine dollars to an acre to over seventeen dollars an acre depending depending on the region so again a, another very successful program and it's this was not over i mean it was vip materializes yeah that that toxin is a lot better uh, we're starting to see a few few cracks in the vip technology as well 
Now, something that we've implemented that, and it's really a pilot project, but we're really wanting to expand this is using these audio updates. And what we've learned is that growers and consultants and, and other people that we typically want to read our newsletter don't have the time or don't want to take the time to read these weekly newsletters all the time. So we've developed a text messaging service where we'll, we'll, we'll record these audio updates and they're short little snippets of information that are regionally based. And we'll text this out to whoever subscribes to it. And then all they have to do is click on it and listen to their phone. I've got a little bit of, of a sample of this. We might need to drop that threshold down a little bit and, and be more realistic, maybe, uh, uh, consider half a thrips per true leaf that we have still attached to the plant would be uh, a little bit more. Re so that that's, and this has been really well received. And so far the clientele really love it. Uh, they see a lot of value to it. They, it's something they can listen to. They're typically five to six minutes long. And uh, we're wanting to really expand our efforts using this type of outreach. Uh, next, I would like to talk a little bit about the specialty crops and, and mainly with the, uh, the greenhouse uh, ornamental industry. And here what we've done is we've, we've really concentrated on developing a biological control program, uh, which will, works really well in a, in a greenhouse setting uh, where we can release uh, the biocontrol agents, integrate them with, with recommended pesticides that aren't going to disrupt it. And, um, and measure the value of, of using biocontrol over, over the insecticides. And it's been very successful. I mean, and, and there's been other things that have come out of this. For instance, you know, who would have thought there was actually a, a decent threshold for white flies on retail uh, poinsettias, uh, when in fact there is, just by, by looking at what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, we've kind of identified what a good threshold would be and then how to integrate two, we, we're looking at two different biocontrol agents here. And then, and this is still fairly, fairly new in the, in the process and how we're going to try to implement it now. And so that's, that's where we're at uh, as far as this program goes, is we're in the implementation part. Uh, another area is mosquito education. And with this, what, we, what we're seeing is, uh, what we're trying to do is, educates you know municipalities cities and, and towns counties on what they can do in their mosquito abatement uh, efforts and help them in learning to identify the different mosquitoes and things that can be done uh, as far as uh, IPM to help reduce mosquito uh, incidences and and then of course with uh, any kind of vector disease that may go along with that and this is built around uh, these five hour vector CEU programs. Uh, and then there's some three day intensive hand on workshops involved. Uh, and uh, Dr. Sonia Swiger, she runs this program. And it's, it's been highly successful. In fact, is not just in Texas anymore. She's been going out to Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi and Oklahoma as well, delivering it, these types of trainings. And it's really became very evident when we had Hurricane Harvey hit the Gulf Coast. And so the impact of this program was really apparent uh, after that hurricane. And I mean, the mosquitoes were horrendous uh, in, along the Gulf Coast. And, and it, was, uh, it was really good to see how well this program was received and, and the, the effectiveness of the uh, of the programs that, that Sonia had uh, emphasized. And then we, we also have uh, a lot of effort in landscape IPM, whether it's uh, in your gardens, flower gardens, uh, vegetable gardens or, or lawn. Uh, one of these is with crepe myrtle bark scale, which is a new invasive pest. And this can be pretty devastating to crepe myrtles, which are very popular in, in most of Texas. And so there was a lot of demand for somebody to do something on crepe myrtle bark scale. And, and they've done a lot of research here looking for resistant uh, cultivars, uh, alternative hoes, impact of natural enemies, and looking at uh, insecticides which are effective. 
and which ones don't flare other pests and which ones are not harmful to pollinators. So it's, it's, a, it's a very large program. And then getting the information out uh, using either, you know, a variety of websites, uh, YouTube videos, newsletters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, this is a fairly new program as well, but uh, it's been highly, it's been very well received. We get, we get a lot of good feedback on the, the crepe myrtle bark scale program. We also do a community fire ant program, and this is where we'll get a, like a homeowners association to all get together and kind of do an area-wide suppression program for fire ants. And this will be using primarily baits um, and, and then look at how effective it is and see, you know, what kind of reduction we get in the, uh, the fire ants and compare it to control, control costs as far as uh, each homeowner doing their, doing their own. And again, this one is, it's another very successful program. Uh, most of these homeowner, their organizations, they'll pay for these programs through their uh, homeowner association fees. Uh, they'll uh, hold these fire and education workshops, tell them what we're doing and, and uh, what we're what's gonna be utilized in your yard so they know, you know, it's not something that's gonna kill Fluffy or something. So anyway, this been, we've seen like a, a very large reduction in pesticides where we've done this, 64% in, a, in a, over a $30 cost uh, savings in insecticides. Another ant that we're running to is the Tawny Crazy Ant, and this is a new invasive ant species source. It's really popped up in 2002, but it's been spreading through the Gulf Coast and into East Texas. And for this program, of course, it's being invasive. It's a whole new pest. This thing makes fire ants look tame. It doesn't sting, but just the numbers are phenomenal when you get out of them. And uh, Dr. Robert Puckett's done a lot of research in how pest control operators in particular can really go about managing this pest more effectively. And he's developed this build a big, bigger buffer program. And that's really, really been very well received uh, throughout uh, the, the Gulf Coast area. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about beekeeping and pollinator uh, stewardship. So with this, we, we've got a beekeeping education program. And this is to, to promote people uh, adopting bees and, and starting beekeeping. So it's, it's kind of a let's get you started type program. And, and it's reached you know, over 14,000 people in the last eight years. So it's a very popular. Um, and we've developed these online course modules and I'll give you a little demonstration of this. Now we're into Module 3, Lesson 2, Installing Nukes. My name is Molly Keck and I am an Integrated Pest Management Program Specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, a board certified entomologist and a beekeeper. Before you have received your... So they can actually just sign up for these, these online courses and, uh, and learn, learn the basics of, of beekeeping. And then of course, in a lot of, actually COVID's driven a lot of this because we've had to go to so much uh, online and, and virtual. Uh, but then as we get more involved, then we can take these and we'll do these uh, hands-on uh, workshops as well. It's been highly impactful. We've had a, a lot of people that have stated they anticipate to accept it. In fact, out of the Participants, 55% say they now keep bees. So, so it really has increased uh, the number of, of beekeepers in, in the state. And a lot of these are hobbyists, but again, it's, it's really increased the, uh, the pollinator potential in, in the environment. Uh, next, I'll talk uh, briefly about the urban structural uh, programs. And with these, we do host several different workshops, one here in College Station, and uh, well, both of these are in, are in the area. Uh, one is the, uh, the Urban Pest Management Conference, and the other one's a termite school. And again, these are hands-on workshops, and with, along with, you know, the Talking Heads type programming as well. But we'll, we'll 
we'll take these people to the field. We'll show them, you know, the how to how to treat for termites or or and different pests, and uh, and then they can get their CEUs as well and learn about pesticide safety and the new laws and regs and that sort of thing. We also have uh, a facility that's up at the Dallas Research and Extension Center. We call it the IPM Experience House. And this is an old dormitory that's been retrofitted to train pest control operators in how to implement integrated pest management inside residential or commercial uh, types of uh, housing and structures. And they'll bring these small groups of individuals in and it's, you know, there may be 10, 10 or 12 in a group and they have these cutaway walls and I mean, it, it's, it's phenomenal what they've done. They've had commercial kitchen setups and they'll just essentially train people in, in how to go through the, the proper way of, of treating for pests and where you find them and things that you just normally don't, get to see, uh, you know, because you can't look through a wall, for instance, as, as seen here. And then we have a, a, a very well recognized and a, I would say a national leader in our Texas, I, the IPM and schools effort. And of course that's, that's led by Janet Hurley and she's been doing this for a long time and just, and she conducts these regionally and uh, well, statewide trainings uh, for, implementing IPM in, in schools. She has a very large outreach effort. She's developed a number of online courses uh, that meet the Texas Department of Agricultural Standards for people to be trained in school IPM. And then she'll go around and when these schools get audited, she'll assist these schools. They, they call her, she'll go and she'll help them prepare, prepare for the audit and things like that. So uh, it's very successful. And uh, I, would, I would say it's, it's, it's a model IPM and schools program. And then just in general, our residential IPM program, because, you know, training people in school and training pest control professionals, there's a lot of people that want to do it themselves. And so to really uh, get people to follow the good IPM practices, we have to go to where they're at. And this is, this was a, another NIFA funded project uh, where we're actually training people and then also training the trainers, for instance, uh, county agents and master volunteers. And then, as I mentioned, because of the COVID situation, we've really switched, you know, how, we, we're, how we're delivering a lot of our information. We've gone digital to virtual education. We've got a lot of online courses now, and we're continuing to add the, to these. There's just there's a list of some of what we've got, and then we've got a lot of information that are that is posted on YouTube, and uh, we've just completely redone our website to try to streamline it and make it easier for people to find things uh, on our website as well. And with that. I think I'm right at my 20 minute mark or close to it. Uh, that'll wrap mine up and I would be happy to address any questions people might have. Yep, you're doing just fine for time. If anyone has any questions, raise your hand. The control should be at the bottom of your Zoom window. I can unmute your mic or if you're feeling a little shy, type your question into the Q&A and I'll read it off to them. I have to admit, listening to the beekeeping presentation, when she said installing nukes for a second there, I was a little concerned, but then I quickly <laughs> got where she was going with that. A lot of what you're talking about here is what was funded under the extension implementation program, but there's a whole lot more going on for IPM at Texas a and isn't there? Oh, absolutely. Um, and you, you can't split them out. Everything is, Inter, inter uh, woven, you know, it's, uh, I mean, we've got a number of NIFA grants and, and, and they, they complement each other, right? I mean, something, something we learn on one grant we use to, in a portion of another grant or, you know, something, something along those lines. It's a, it's a whole program and we, you know, we're going to take any information we can get from anywhere we can get it. That's 
applicable and we're going to apply it. It uh, looks like you've had really good success in that over the years. Texas A&M in the South, we hear a lot of great things about the program. So it's always great to see a little more of the inside of it. All right. Thank you. No questions for anyone. So you, you have answered all the questions they could possibly want, and they found it just a great presentation. So. All righty. Thank you, Joe. No problem. Thank you, David. We're going to move on to Rick Besson from University of Kentucky. All right. Hopefully uh, you can see my screen. We can. We can see it with your slides currently on the left-hand side. Okay. Uh, I have to apologize in that uh, I, I do not have a camera that's working on my computer right now. So uh, you have the benefit of not having to look at me uh, while I give my presentation. So I was going to talk to you about the uh, the Kentucky EIP program. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, David had an excellent presentation with Texas. Uh, Kentucky is just a lot different than Texas. Our agriculture here is different. Our situation is different. Uh, so just a little bit about Kentucky agriculture. Uh, believe it or not, even though we're not a large state, we're fifth in terms of the number of farms in the U.S., uh, in terms of the U.S. Uh, ag census, uh, but we're 39th in farm size. So our, our median farm size is 163 acres. Uh, we have a lot of river, stream, lake, and pond frontage. Uh, altogether in the state, we have 92,000 miles of river and stream frontage, and that's second only to Alaska. And that does create some IPM issues because uh, agriculture has been pointed out to have a significant impact on water quality. And we've seen some things, uh, particularly in some of our car karst soils, as well as some of our uh, rivers near uh, farms where uh, we've had issues with fertilizers and uh, herbicides in, in the water. So that, that has been something that we've needed to address here. In Kentucky, uh, even though we're not a large state, we have 120 counties, and I believe this makes us third in the country behind Texas and Georgia. Uh, we have very diverse clientele here, and our leading commodities, uh, really, that, that, that we have would be, you know, poultry, uh, horses, of course, uh, beef cattle, soybeans, corn, wheat, uh, hemp, even though it's not a major commodity, there's a, a major amount of interest in it. And tobacco is uh, declining. It's, it's a fraction of what, what it has been over the years. Uh, so, you know, when you think about all those farms, fifth in terms of farm number and 39th in farm size, a lot of our farms are family farms. They're small family farms that we have in the state. Uh, a lot of the producers of these family farms have other employment. Uh, they're part-time farmers. And farming may not be the primary income with uh, many of our, our smaller farms across the state. We have a lot of challenges going on right now in agriculture, uh, low commodity prices. Uh, I've made the argument that, that this is a, a, a tool that can be used to increase IPM adoption. Uh, when commodity prices are low. Uh, we do have offside pesticide movement that's occurring. Uh, dicamba, glyphosate, uh, as well as atrazine uh, have been problems. Uh, we're suffering from a number of invasive pests and disease. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, my, my former department chair asked me to list the number of invasive pests back in the 90 that 90s that uh, we had to deal with. And it's interesting to see about 80% of them back then were invasive pests. Uh, what's changed today is just the rate of invasive establishment has increased quite a bit. And then the, the other thing, uh, particularly uh, facing our agronomic crops is uh, herbicide resistant weeds. So these are some of the challenges we have. We also run into some challenges uh, of, of IPM on small farms. And you know, I, I work as a, a commodity specialist in, in fruit and vegetables and some things I've run across is some of the uh, tools that are available in other states may not be available for our growers in Kentucky. Uh, for example, you know, mating disruption, it's a great way to uh, in, uh, 
you know, kick IPM up to a, a, a higher level, uh, it's not available in the state that companies won't register it here in Kentucky just because we have smaller acreages and we don't have a major industry. And so as an example, we've been able to get one product uh, registered uh, for the last five years, but we have to go through a third party paying the registration for it, the, the companies won't. And it, it really limits some of the tools that we have available uh, for some of our smaller growers. So how our, our EIP program is structured in Kentucky. Uh, we, we have the overall statewide coordination. Uh, I manage that, you know, we, we have an annual meeting, we have a steering committee, uh, we have an insect trapping network associated with, with the coordination level. Below that, we have five working groups. Uh, we have the CATS, the Kentucky Agricultural Training School. We have an agronomic crops working group, a fruit crops working group, vegetable crops, and a nursery crops working group. Now, some of these can change over the years with, with uh, different funding cycles. Uh, right now, we're, we're considering having a livestock uh, IPM working group uh, and as well as a school IPM working group. So just with our Kentucky uh, CATS program, what this is, it's, a, it's an innovative program. Uh, it has very small class sizes. And what we're looking at is, you know, eight to 15 students in a class. And it's, it's hands-on. Uh, it's not just your traditional field day where you have hundreds of people come in. Uh, they're small groups by design, more personalized, uh, and they're very timely topics that they cover. So uh, when they bring people in, the, those topics are going to change throughout the season, uh, depending upon what, what's a problem and uh, the, the cycle of the crop that we happen to be in. Uh, so these are synchronized. They're, they're personal. Uh, many of these are indoor, um, but the, we also have some of these are outdoor. Actually, I should say that the other way around. Most of them are outdoor, but we do have some in, indoor meetings as well. And uh, so th these address some of the, the uh, uh, major commodities that we grow in the state. Uh, the audience has been certified crop advisors, uh, county ag agents, agribusiness personnel, some of the bigger growers, as well as uh, representatives of, of government industries. Now, you know, COVID has, has thrown a wrench into everything. One of the things that they've uh, made an adjustment to COVID has been developing what they call this Coffee Cats series. And uh, basically try, trying to come up with uh, video uh, that, that address uh, a topic in the time it takes to uh, drink a cup of coffee. And so, uh, these are videos with live discussion, uh, questions and, and answering. Uh, there is a separate advisory committee for this group. It, it held its first meeting in 2019. And so uh, this, this group is continuing to, to move forward. Uh, just some of the outcome, uh, you can see with social media, uh, Twitter, uh, they've also been trying to estimate some of the value of the information as well as the number of acres that, that have been uh, represented by the people that have come to the class. And what they've been able to gain, gain is that uh, the information uh, is about four to $5 million a year for those that uh, uh, are, participate in this program. The next working group would be our grain crops working group. Again, these would be the small grains as well as uh, corn and soybeans. Uh, so some of the objectives they had with our last funding cycle would be uh, wheat virus and corn nematode uh, monitoring and identification. So trying to uh, determine uh, through systematic sampling what our, our key viruses and nematodes are in corn. Uh, they have an intensive uh, weed management uh, training. Uh, this is uh, partly through a class on campus as well as weed nurseries associated that are used during uh, some of our field days uh, and surveying for agronomic uh, insect pests. Again, uh, systematic surveys for a number of our new uh, invasive pests of, of these agronomic crops. So, you know, they, they've used some of the funding available through this program uh, to implement uh, field demonstrations. Uh, this is particularly at the uh, Western Kentucky Research and Education Center. Uh, they, they hold an annu annual grain crops meeting with the specialists. They bring them about 30 specialists. 
uh, and really uh, that's used to identify what, what their major uh, research and education thrusts are gonna be uh, with IPM in these crops. They've produced some uh, comprehensive management guides the last few years, and they've instituted what they call the early bird training series. So uh, they actually begin training for the coming year in uh, October and November, uh, before people have purchased their inputs for the next year, uh, trying to get information to these people so they can uh, better uh, acquire some of those inputs for the next season. And oh, I should, should mention some, some of the uh, uh, topics have been, you know, soybean cyst nematode, frog eye leaf spot resistance, uh, dicamba and weed updates, uh, breakdown of fragipan soils, and uh, cover crops effects on, on nitrogen rates. Uh, Carl Bradley has been heading up the pathology with this group. Uh, he, he's found that uh, through, the, through the funding and the systematic surveys that really barley yellow dwarf virus has been the most common uh, virus affecting small grains in Kentucky. Uh, uh, Kirsten Weiss, uh, our corn pathologist, she's identified the spiral and lesion nematodes as the most commonly observed nematodes in field corn. So this is helping to better direct our educational programs. Uh, in terms of insects, uh, uh, Dr. Raul Villanueva has been uh, uh, doing some surveys with uh, a brown marmorated stink bug. The, this insect is continuing to move uh, westward across Kentucky. And you can see with his latest survey this year, uh, he, he's finding that to represent about 22.6% of the stink bug population in soybeans. Uh, similar to what David said with sugarcane aphid uh, uh, in Texas, uh, it is a problem for us in Kentucky, particularly with sweet sorghum. This is a high value crop that can be worth ten dollars to $13,000 an acre, and this is an insect that can absolutely uh, decimate a crop. Uh, and so uh, we've worked with uh, growers in a number of communities to find sustainable ways to manage this pest. Uh, kudzu bug, we've been surveying for this. Uh, we may not be surveying for this in the future because we have found that even though it does occur in Kentucky, it doesn't look like it's going to become a pest. And then with weed science. And uh, again, the, this component with uh, Dr. Travis Legleiter has been to improve weed identif identification skills, uh, integrated management tactics for wheat. Uh, th there is uh, an intensive uh, crop pest management field school uh, that's been used to uh, educate growers. And uh, he has measured some of the outcomes in terms of uh, improved weed identification skills and a better understanding of integrated weed management techniques. In terms of our fruit IPM program, uh, th this has been a, a, a very integral uh, program. We, we have a number of uh, fruit crops here, apples and peaches, as well as uh, the small fruit. Uh, the approach has been using uh, demonstrations, field demonstrations, uh, webinars, conferences, uh, field days. Uh, we've been generating a lot of material in terms of uh, fact sheets, articles, uh, videos, uh, web pages. Uh, we do have an uh, email alert system that we use uh, for timely alerts, and we can target this for specific fruit crops. Uh, and, and we have uh, uh, developed a number of uh, iPhone apps uh, for identification and management of some of, some of these insects and uh, fruit pests. Uh, we've had to change things a lot with COVID, just like everyone has. So a lot more uh, virtual resources. Uh, uh, we've gone to uh, webinars instead of field days. Uh, again, we've developed web pages. You know, uh, one of the things that went over very well has been the integration between the pesticide safety education program and the fruit IPM program. And some of these field days, while we do do the traditional IPM trainings, we integrate this with proper pesticide application uh, techniques as well. And we, we've had uh, sprayer schools as part of our uh, fruit IPM uh, trainings. And that, that's gone over very well. Uh, growers are actually able to use less material because they're putting it on in a much more effective manner. Uh, so, you know, we, we have some diseases this year. It's, it's, it's changed for 2021. It looks like 
Some of the COVID restrictions are gonna uh, stay in place at least through the early part of next year. Uh, we're gonna be continuing to monitor, monitor for uh, pests and diseases. Uh, and some of those particular pests and diseases we're monitoring for are the fruit rots as well as the, the stink bugs. We have an advanced grower training uh, scheduled for July of 2021. And we're hoping that we can uh, keep, keep that in place. And it, it's gonna depend upon what happens with the, the COVID restrictions in the state. In terms of uh, vegetable IPM, uh, we tend to have a retail uh, industry here. Uh, we used to have a lot more uh, wholesale production of vegetables that's declined over the years. Uh, now we have about 9,000 farmers markets across the state. So uh, many of our producers are direct marketing these crops. Uh, in terms of IPM implement, implementation, uh, this past year we had four virtual agent trainings. Uh, had a number of specialists that were involved with this. One of the things, because we have a lot of non-traditional audiences, we have a, a number of uh, Mennonite and Amish communities across the state that may not have the same uh, internet access. Uh, one thing we developed uh, in 2019 was a weekly uh, phone-in hotline where producers could phone in, they get a recorded message every week. Uh, we did that for 20 weeks this, this week, and it, it went fairly well in some of these communities uh, that we were able to get very timely IPM information out uh, to the people that are gonna use it on the ground. And sometimes you have to use innovative techniques uh, to get your information out to some of these non-traditional audiences. Uh, we also use uh, small scale demonstration plots. Uh, so uh, some of this was with uh, uh, tomato pesticide delivery, but also looking at alternative uh, uh, field spacing uh, relationships and, and how that relates to some of the diseases in tomatoes and peppers. And so uh, demonstration has been a, a strong part of our approach. Uh, we've been measuring the impact of uh, some of our programs. And you can see uh, with some of these different topics, uh, the before and after change, uh, th this was with agents. And uh, we've seen uh, strong improvements uh, when they've gone through some, some of these trainings. The last working group I was gonna talk about was our nurse, nursery crops working group. Uh, Dr. Wynn Dunwell has been leading this up. He, he is retired and that's, this is transitioning over to a, another co-PI who's gonna be heading this up. But uh, you can see what, what their goals were. Uh, so IPM uh, as well as other uh, nursery plant production uh, issues that, that they've been addressing with this program. So it's not just IPM, but it's nutrient management, it's irrigation management, substrate management that has been part of this program. Uh, a lot of the people don't come to the program just for IPM. They, they come to learn how to better manage the crops that they're responsible for. Uh, this program has actually been very innovative in terms of uh, posting things online, uh, YouTubes and podcasts and other things. They've also been recording uh, or been able to estimate the value of some of their programs. And so uh, they did estimate the value of the in-person programs. They've also estimated the value of when people come online and they listen to some of the, the uh, podcasts and the, the videos that are, that are available. Uh, they've also been, you know, even though it's a, a nursery crop program, uh, they're very involved with uh, working with local schools. And uh, they, they had a, a, a really nice program uh, working with local schools, working with master gardeners in the area, uh, talking about uh, IPM, nursery crops IPM, IPM in the garden. And this all fell under the umbrella of the nursery, nursery crops IPM program. The last thing I, I was gonna mention here is they've also been surveying nurseries for IPM usage. And they, they've been doing this about every five years. And now, now we can see how adoption of different IPM tools has evolved over the last 20 years. Uh, and I have to say, you know, the, the last uh, survey didn't have the most positive results in that it dropped in a number of categories, but it's important to keep track of what the IPM usage is, uh, where, where we can make improvements 
in terms of uh, delivering education, uh, reinforcing the importance of different IPM uh, practices. So with that, uh, I would be happy to answer any questions. Great presentation. Um, as with David's presentation, anybody who wants to ask a question, you can raise your hand, or if you're shy, put a question in the Q&A section, and we'll we'll see what Rick has to say about it. Um, it's interesting to see. You're you're right. Kentucky is definitely not Texas. Um, You've done a masterful job of trying to knit together all of, of what you can with the EIP funds that are available. Um, how broad, how much of the, good way to phrase this, how much additional IPM is there that, that is this like the core of it or is this just the sections that were able to be covered by EIP? This is uh, this is really where EIP is interacting with IPM, but IPM in the state is much larger. You know, at, as an example, I went down to Letcher County a couple years ago, and I was doing a presentation for um, pest control operators, and I had a pest control operator from a, a school. He was retired uh, in charge of pest control for the school system. And so, you know, I asked him what he was doing. And basically, he was at a very high level of IPM implementation. You know, do we have a specific program in school IPM? The answer is no. But IPM has worked its way into uh, just about every aspect of pest management within the state. I can... I always feel for the IPM coordinators in every state, you're trying to meld everything together. You have a lot of different funding sources. There's not just one IPM fund that controls all the pest management. So you guys have to be masters of making a quilt of all the funding and opportunities that are out there to keep everything covered. You know, um, one, one thing I didn't mention, and it, it, it occurred to me when I was listening to David's talk, and that, that had to do with uh, bullworm in cotton and sort of the complacency of having technology that works and forgetting how to scout or the importance of scouting and something like that, or things like that. We, we had a similar situation in uh, field corn here in Kentucky. You know, BT Corn's just done an outstanding job managing uh, uh, European corn borer. And uh, with the upsurge in uh, bourbon consumption and, and the, the quadrupling of bourbon distilleries within Kentucky, there is a demand for non-GMO uh, corn. And so a number of producers started growing non-BT corn and they had forgot how to scout and manage European corn borer. And it, it's that whole complacency when when uh, things are working very well, how quickly they forget how to use IPM, how to, how to scout, monitor, use thresholds, and uh, apply pesticides accordingly. So sometimes uh, it's just a matter of uh, reminding people and re-educating them on things they've forgotten. Excellent. Excellent presentation. No one has any questions. You, you shocked and awed them. They are just inspired by the IPM programs in Kentucky. Um, thank you both for presenting today. We'll go ahead and with no questions, go ahead and close out this session. Um, the IPM hours, uh, Kayla, these are gonna be a monthly occurrence, is that correct? Yep, so they're gonna be uh, once a month, the first Wednesday of the month, and they're always gonna be at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Okay. And if I wanted to make sure that I was subscribing to this and all other events, how would I do, go about that? So I just put some information in the chat about how to learn more about us. Um, so you can subscribe to our newsletter uh, for that information. And also, I see that I did not uh, put the link for the IPM hour. That, of course, I forgot something. Um, but I will put the information for the IPM hour in the chat as well, but it's at our website, southernipm.org. All right. 
with that, thank you all for attending and hope the rest of your week is as, as unstressful and uh, enjoyable as it can be.